Far from here, my home county, I first saw crushing poverty in 1962 in the back streets of Hong Kong. And later in the same year, I saw worse in Delhi and in Indian villages. We economists are interested in people's well-being, which we measure as utility. In the richer countries, most of us do in truth live quite well. But there in India, I saw people who plainly had too little to eat, had nowhere to sit or lie comfortably, had diseases no one was trying to cure, and many had never been to school. As far as I could tell, they were much of the time miserable. Aren't our basic needs almost universally the same? Yet by the chances of life, some are miserable while others live well. How do we live with that? Passing through a slum on the edge of my ancestral hometown of New Delhi, drifting towards the city were the groans of systematic struggle. Women toiling in the hot sun, carrying bricks on their heads, upholding misery. Working in appalling conditions, rolling the dice, chancing ill health, accident, and death. I noticed a lady in her sari, weakened, worn out from hard labor spent, for she was building a palace for some rich guy. Dulled by the monotony, she wrestled with hunger each day. She returns home to her squalor, to the frustration of how to feed her children, who are excluded from knowledge because they too are forced into merciless labor. But the rich man's child studies, invents, goes on to create and direct. He finds his place in the world. Her hands are blistered from injustice. She's denied self-expression, to comprehend, to know, or maybe to enrich our civilization. The higher self she craves is mutilated, for she is trapped in the dungeon named poverty. She covertly aspires, but the world's ostentation mocks her. Her delusions humiliate her. She looks out at a world of plenty, but her faraway faith is trampled on. This was my first experience of poverty and the plight unraveled before me. Economic segregation was the root of all her fury and the shame I faced as a free citizen of the world. This is not our highest humanity, but a dismal disparity. Being an economist, I asked myself how much it would cost to turn this misery into comfortable well-being. Economics is about applying money, labor, and resources where they can do most good. Surely it would be much cheaper to improve the lives of these people struggling on a tiny income than to improve the lives of well-off people to the same extent. But it is not enough to have ideas about measuring the lives of the poor or about policies that could improve them. For me as an economist, ideas have to change the world. Or what is the point? Today, the, the way we have built economics, 
people are not at the center of the economics. Somehow is the money is the center of the economics. People are treated like a trash. It's a kind of uh, things that has need to be done, and they are the uh, pyramid builders uh, to build a pyramid for them. They, they, they don't have their own existence. That is an insult to human being. Human being is the center of the whole uh, planet, and that's what the, we, we should be doing. Each one, little kid who's born in the street, he's the center of the world, like anybody else. What we've seen increasingly is increasing inequalities, uh, disparities between the top 1% and everybody else, or the top 5% and everybody else. Um, we also see continuing disparities between the countries that are doing very well and the countries that are being left behind. It's not the case that a rising tide lifts all boats. What we've learned is that some boats can rise very fast, but that tide can actually lead to smaller boats being smashed in the waves that are associated with those tides. So our economic policies have to recognize that this is one of the most important problems of the 21st century. It's a moral problem, but it goes beyond that. Uh, it's a political, social, uh, and economic problem. The world today is an amazing place. I mean, if you look at people around here in Cambridge, uh, many of them, what they spend in a day is uh, more than what, you know, quarter of the world's population spends in a year, something like of that order of magnitude. The life expectancy difference between people living in a good part of Mumbai and one of the Mumbai slums would be well over 15 years. A kilo of uh, our uh, great organic Arabic coffee you buy from the farmer in the mountains of Timor-Leste for uh, 30 cents. In Hong Kong, you can sell it for $200 a kilo. So these are the disparities that make the West rich. The rich have got the pan by the handle. There's income inequality, there are large health inequalities, there are inequalities of opportunity. One of the most revealing aspects of it is wealth inequality. One family, the Waltons, together have as much wealth as the uh, bottom 30% or so of our whole society. Two families, the Koch brothers and the Waltons, have uh, as much wealth as roughly the bottom 44% of our society. In a way, this is testimony to how wealthy they are but it's also testimony to how poor the bottom half of our population is. But it's also testimony to the fact that trickle-down economics doesn't work. There's growing discontent about the collusion between political and business elites who are starting to hoard wealth and hoard power. For a tiny sector of the population, actually a fraction of 1%, wealth is concentrated uh, beyond the dreams of avarice. And those are policy decisions. So for example, uh, this has been correlated among many other things with sharp lowering of taxes for the very rich, which of course has these effects. And it's worth noticing that that's against public opinion. Uh, public opinion during this whole period has called for higher taxes on the wealthy. And that tells you something about the meaning of inequality. So at all stages of the system, the rich are able to entrench and increase their institutional power, and the poor find themselves pushed down and out. If you think that they're just a few creaming off all the resources and all the income in a society, it makes, I think, for less harmony and less ability to work together. Now, what is the practical damage that inequality does? On the one hand, it, I think, breeds social conflict, because clearly when you have your neighbor, you know, showing sort of ostentatious display in weddings and, you know, having fancy possessions, and you have not, you don't know where your next meal is coming from, you can be sure that it's going to cause tensions. This 
widening gap really is raising the tension and the fabric of our societies in Africa and elsewhere. It means some people are gonna really fall off out of the uh, equation, and that is serious. People losing hope, people feel really disenfranchised, are alienated, we end up with strange phenomena like terrorism, violence, or waves of migration. Our societies are falling apart, and that's because I believe underlying it and the factors that are driving it is growing inequality. Some people just feel the system is not working for them. I think we're in a, a, a very dangerous few decades where we combine very, very wide differences in prosperity between countries that are increasingly um, neighbors of each other, increasingly neighbors because the, the costs of connectedness uh, have fallen a lot. And so people are well aware of life elsewhere. The disparity between rich and poor is growing increasingly rapidly. The world's population is going to grow uh, from 2015 uh, to the middle of the century from around 7 billion to over 9 billion. We hope living standards will improve in that time. So we have to ask ourselves the question, how can the extra demand for food be managed? We're talking about profound change, change of a kind that the world hasn't seen in the case of three degrees centigrade for three million years. A fundamental rewriting of the relationships between human beings and the planet, one that will affect us all, one that will involve the movement of hundreds of millions of people, and that likely to cause conflict. And we also know that conflict hits poor people uh, particularly hard, and conflict is enormously destructive to development. For the three billion plus people that are gonna be living in shanty towns in decades to come, there's a real threat of deep poverty. So that is, will they have the jobs? Will they have the incomes? Will they have the infrastructure, the water, the sanitation, the roads, the electricity? And will they be able to connect with the opportunities of globalization? Massive opportunity, but also new threats. And the new threats are marginalization. This is humanity's agenda, which connects all continents, religions, cultures, and issues that are vital to our common security and wider global interests. The great drama of our time being to lift the bottom billion out of poverty, to provide credible hope. Poverty is not inevitable. It is not a fate, it's not a destiny. The circumstances arise uh, because extreme poverty has to do with wars, instability, has to do with uh, corruption in our own uh, countries, incompetence, uh, waste, uh, mismanagement, etc. So it's not inevitable. Poverty is built into the system itself. Poverty is not caused by people. It's imposed on them. It is something uh, coming from outside making people be poor, remain poor, and so on. Because the current system, what we call capitalism, is basically a sucking machine. Uh, it sucks juice from the bottom and transports it to the top. So over time, top becomes very juicy, and the bottom becomes dry, and that's what we call poverty. Inequality translates very quickly into inequality of political power, of decision-making in the political system. So it's self-generating. As wealth concentrates, so does political power, which leads to decisions, political decisions, that increase the cycle of, in, of inequality and marginalize the public. In most, but not all, countries, Within the country, there is an increase in inequality. I say most countries because there are some countries bucking the trend. Brazil, Argentina, Bolivia, 
a number of the countries in Latin America. And that, to me, shows that this increase in inequality is not the inevitable result of just economic forces. It is a result of policies. Countries that have managed to reduce inequality instituted policies that were directed at that, and they succeeded. Unfortunately, many other countries, including the United States, policies have been put into place which predictably and predicted have led to more inequality. Nowadays, there's a new disparity. People hardly know there is a difference between people who understand and others who are just being manipulated. Over the years, aid has been increasingly targeted on poor people. The Millennium Development Goals, with their explicit objective to reduce poverty in its various forms, income poverty, education poverty, health poverty, and so on, those Millennium Goals did lead to a much greater focus on poverty through um, aid around projects uh, directly which could employ poor people, increase agricultural productivity, get the children of poor people to school and so on. That kind of aid has helped lift incomes in developing countries and thereby reduced inequality. When the MDGs were adopted in September 2000, there was a redoubling of the commitment to pay 0.7% of the GDP to support international development assistance what is also commonly known as ODA, Overseas Development Assistance. If you were to look at the gap in the 0.7%, some people have said that it runs into almost $1 trillion. If you put it in perspective, and 0.7% is, as a percentage, it's peanuts. I mean, it really, you can't even really notice it in an overall budget. When I was running the Millennium Campaign, we had this pizza. Uh, which we had created, and we were trying to find out, you know, when you cut that pizza and try and get 0.7% of that, it's not even a crumb. You know? So so if you want to do it, I mean, you can do it. If you do want to do it, you're going to find 100 reasons not to do it. Unfortunately, the reality is that the rich countries, there's very few countries who are giving 0.7%. If you take out the Nordics and the Dutch and the UK, most recently, uh, there's almost no country which meets the 0.7% uh, number. There is an enormous amount of skepticism about foreign aid. First of all, in, in, and I'm only talking about the United States now, people, if you ask most Americans, how much money do you think we spend on foreign aid? They'll say $30, $40 uh, out of 100. And of course that's wrong. We spend less than I think one tenth of 1%. It's relatively very, very low. We have very few European countries that have shown generosity, solidarity, and wisdom. Because it's not only generosity, it's not only solidarity, it's wisdom. You do not support developing countries struggling against poverty. You, have, you help creating social tensions, political instability, conflicts, of course, exacerbated by, in many situations, uh, poor leadership in these countries. So what do you do? You end up with refugees uh, flocking to your uh, doorsteps. And then what do you do? You erect walls. So it is really myopic, you know, uh, thinking that you can resolve your fiscal problems, your deficits, by sacrificing uh, overseas development budget. One of the main problems is development has never been a main agenda. Colonial history is very often being forgotten. What we did leave behind was to a very large extent, I would say, destruction. Destruction of cultures, destruction of an economy. We were pillaging countries. British Empire was built on oppression, hegemonic power, extraction of resources, and killing of the indigenous people. Once they've made a lot of money, they want to give something back. That's okay. And that's great. 
but that's peanuts compared to what is extracted from developing countries. Historically, a lot of the aid was given bilaterally. Bilateral are the individual donor government programs. And the objective was not so much to foster development, particularly pro-poor development, but it was really given as part of a country's strategic foreign policy, win friends, influence people, maintain economic influence in countries. In a lot of bilateral programs, reducing poverty isn't really the main purpose of the program. It's the commercial calling card for the nation's government ministers going to call upon Brazil or China or whatever. So we shouldn't judge good aid by total aid because total aid is contaminated by these extraneous reasons. I think international support is very important and also it's not just about the quantity of support, it's the quality of support. In many, many cases, we've unfortunately found this whole phenomenon of tied aid. So if a government gives aid, they want to take it on the other hand. So if you want British money, historically, you had to buy British Land Rover uh, Jeeps or, you know, trucks. And, and this is the kind of nonsense which goes on at the same time. So, I mean, it's not just quantity, but it's also quality. We produce some of the best bananas in the world. And do you realize that Australian troops were eating bananas brought from Australia. The objective is supposedly to help developing countries, but it's actually to favor exporting industries in the donor countries. Some countries impose conditions, like Japan impose conditions. If you have Japanese aid, let's say Japan decide to donate $100 million for infrastructure development in my country, the bidding process is only among Japanese. It's not open to the rest of the world. We had the Tanzania air traffic control scandal. This was an air traffic control system being sold by British Aerospace. As it then was, Tanzania didn't have any uh, military aircraft, so it wasn't needed. If the government is misspending money on a useless air traffic control system, and we're giving money into the government's budget, in order to fund the Department of Education in Tanzania in order to improve its education system. In effect, the aid money is paying for the air traffic control system. Later on, the American courts found it was corrupt and required British Aerospace to pay back money to Tanzania. So the tying of foreign flows has to do with the fact that once they're at your doorstep, you have no choice. You pretend to uh, donate uh... $50 million to Timor-Leste or to Bangladesh. But uh, actually, this $50 million, a lot of it will be spent on uh, buying your own equipment, whether Japanese technology or German technology, and then you ship off to Bangladesh. And you have to bring in uh, uh, Japanese or German uh, specialists who will do the assessment, the survey, all the studies. Uh, so. Out of this money, uh, a lot is uh, stay behind when they say, you know, we provide a hundred million dollars. And when they say we provide a hundred million dollars, I guarantee you, many of these European companies, they start uh, getting ready. Oh, there are a hundred million dollars going to Timor-Leste. So let's line up to try to get a good chunk of the contracts. The lobby in their country for aid, a very powerful part of that lobby for aid are the companies that are going to benefit from the Tide aid, from the fact that some of the aid has to be spent on the nation's own companies. Indeed, I've met ambassadors who complain that all they're ever asked to do is run parties, you know, in the countries they're working in for British firms who are trying to sell their products in the country concerned. Companies invest a lot in lobbying. There are more lobbyists in Brussels than there are civil servants in Brussels. So we talk about the effectiveness of aid. I think also we need to get out of tight aid. I mean, there's so many examples uh, where aid is, is, is conditioned. Or you must buy, you know, I'm giving you $10, but you must use this $10 
to buy my from my my companies here and even so your product really doesn't do the job or it is double the international prices I can get somewhere else no I have to do it this way of course that devalues the aid. I think we should be a little bit more transparent uh, in in offering aid I mean that's 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 a proper thing to do the economic objectives are bizarre which is sort of you know you give aid but you say you have to buy buy it from a French company or Italian company that, that's just pure waste there's no I mean, you could just give that money straight to that company or not, but you know, you, the way, way you do it is sort of distorts what gets done. It creates scope for corruption. It's just in every possible way a disaster. So the, I, I see no advantage to the economic tying of aid. You see that the Department for International Development giving massive contracts to great big British commercial consultancy firms. So that's a form of tying and I'm not sure Adam Smith International, PwC, and so on, are the most obvious managers of aid programs that really understand the conditions in developing countries, but that's the way British aid seems to be going. The main powers uh, which you have to, uh, to confront are not your colleagues in the cabinet. They are big business. They are the powers who more or less would be very much interested in continuing the colonial relations of the past in new colonial forms. They are the powers who have an interest in a financial system which is not at all interested in poor people, neither in Africa nor in Europe. They are the powers who want to continue to deliver arms and arms uh, to developing countries. Uh, they are the powers uh, who want to dump our European agriculture products on the markets of Africa so that the women over there hardly can earn any money anymore by selling chicken or, or, or tomatoes on the village market on the basis of technology subsidies and quota protecting our own farmers with the result that products of developing countries are not easily coming on the European market and that overproduction is easily being dumped on the markets of developing countries. Under the Department of Agriculture in the United States, when there is an excess of production, we want to keep the farmers, we want to ensure that our farmers are continuing to, to produce goods. So the Department of Agriculture buys the excess grains from, from farmers in the United States and then gives that as aid to other countries. Now, this sounds like a great idea. There's too much rice in the United States. We subsidize the rice farmers and then we give the rice away to starving people in, in developing countries. Well, this is a typical example of how a good charitable idea goes horribly wrong. So a few years ago, there was an excess of rice in the United States. And what did we do? We sent it to Haiti. So the US rice was selling at a dollar a bag and the Haitian grown rice was selling at $3 a bag. So we wiped out the Haitian rice market. The next year, all the Haitian rice farmers didn't plant rice because they had been wiped out the year before. But that year, the US government didn't send rice to Haiti. And so there were rice riots. Then Haiti becomes dependent on foreign aid for rice. And so this is an example of, of aid gone, gone terribly wrong. Many aid activities nowadays serve much more the interest of the donor countries by linking it again to, to the interests of companies of Western countries, by also linking it to our geopolitical interests. We tell many developing countries that they can receive assistance if they behave politically. I come with an example. Egypt, we had Arab Spring, people rising up for democracy and human rights. Final outcome of that 
so-called revolution was a strengthening of the military regime with just another person. The military stayed as strong as they were. There are more people in jail now than even under, under Mubarak. There are more human rights violations than before. And there is more assistance to Egypt from Western countries because he now stays our friend. Unfortunately, the international community until now, they support the dictatorism and they support the corrupted regime. We suffer from their, from their conspiracy and from their absence and from their silence. Egypt is, is a very poor country, but it's much, much, much richer than the poorest countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. It's the biggest recipient of US aid in, uh, in all of Africa. And this is directly a result of Egypt's decision to accommodate with Israel. I think if we were transparent about what was being achieved there, maybe that's fine. Maybe it was a good, you know, you buy off some army people in Egypt and you get some, you know, some chance for peace. Maybe that's worth it. But I think we should label it as such. If we labeled it, when we knew, then the aid budget would look a lot smaller and that would be fine. Then people wouldn't feel that, you know, we are spending so much money for the poor and nothing's happening. In the case of Britain, we're always seeking to sell arms. In fact, it's 80% of the arms sold in the world are sold by the five permanent members of the Security Council. And of course, they in turn are supposed to be protecting international peace and security. So that's a kind of distortion at the heart of international power in, in the multilateral system that's quite a worry. International assistance is necessary for a number of reasons. For instance, reconstruction after a war. However, if you, as a Western country, are responsible also for that war, which has been the case in quite a number of countries, and then you give assistance in order to overcome some of the consequences by means of reconstruction, and you carry that out with your own companies, I would say that is perverse. It's a waste of money, and that is to a large extent being done in Iraq, in Afghanistan, and in Libya, uh, is going to be done in Syria. They use taxpayers' money and public money in order to do that. The causes of war are racial hatred, arms trade, arms race, exploitation of the poor, and all these are causes of war. And the consequences are dire, as we have seen in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Syria, where not only millions of people have perished, but trillions of dollars has been spent. And just imagine what we could have done with trillions of dollars. We could have lifted the poor out of their poverty. There have been examples where aid has been very tightly uh, tied to the particular political interests or commercial interests of the donor country. One famous example was the Purgao Dam in uh, Malaysia, where it was pretty clear at the time that the reason that this project was being pushed because the local politicians were looking for arms supplies and the supplier of the aid, or the intended supplier of the aid, in this case the British government, uh, was looking for arms deals. In the case of, famously, the Purgao Dam case, Britain did offer aid, I think, for building um, bridges in Malaysia or something like that, small bridges, in return for selling British helicopters. So that was a direct trade-off, which was found illegal by the British courts. The danger then comes that the military say, give us the aid, and they're spending, as well as killing people, they're spending aid to try and get them on their side, and then the aid gets mixed up with military objectives and then nobody in the receiving country trusts the aid workers and you get high levels of killing of aid workers, which is happening in Afghanistan and so on. The figures I have seen is that uh, only 10% of money pledged to Afghanistan are actually spent in Afghanistan. Much of the ODA for many, many years was very uh, misrepresented. For instance, when uh, an European Union country 
talk about, let's say, a hundred million dollars to country A or to, to my country, Timor-Leste, well, actually, the best, most optimistic estimation is that um, only 30% of that money pledged actually is spent in the country, in infrastructure, education, training, uh, job creation, uh, etc. 70% of the money is actually spent by consultants, uh, officials traveling back and forth, endless report writing. You know, in my own country, in 10 years, we had 3,000 reports, expert studies, done on a country of one million. We were psychoanalyzed from every possible angle. Do we need more studies? And I have to say, even the UN, you know, sometimes do absolutely silly things. Do you realize that the UN has a special rapporteur on extreme poverty? And what does a special rapporteur on extreme poverty does when she comes to my country? Well, uh, to talk to the poor people that, do you realize you are poor? Norway, which is a very progressive country, but they've got a very big NGO sector, and Norwegian NGOs campaign very hard for high aid spend, and a lot of it goes through them. So then there's a tying that Norway must use Norwegian NGOs. So it's not all bad guys in this. It's not just commercial companies. It's sometimes NGOs have an interest in this. Aid tying is an old scandal that's still going on in many countries. It's a recipe for the disastrous use of aid. It's a recipe for failure. And then everyone can say, oh, look at this, it doesn't work. There's a crisis of trust in the aid world. Taxpayers don't trust aid agencies to do a good job. Sometimes they're right, sometimes they're wrong. But unless we rebuild that trust, aid isn't going anywhere. I think what's really, I think, misleading is this sort of this mismatch between the volume of, so-called volume of aid and the real aid that goes out to people who need it. So this has to be something that societies themselves come to, the realization that if they want to be useful, if they want to be maximally useful, they better not tie their aid. There are many governments who are untied. There's no question that it can be untied. You know, all of these, whether it is the Western donor governments or the governments in the developing world, it finally boils down to a political commitment to doing things. I mean, there's no reason why it can't be untied. Absolutely not. Fortunately, many countries now are start to move away uh, from that. Still, we see examples happening there. And it's not only the West. Uh, China does that sometimes, and others do it as well. And I think we really need to get over that. In the US, for example, the Millennium Ch Challenge Corporation, which Bush set up for all his faults, was an attempt to tie the hands of policymakers so that aid could not be used except based on some evidence. So there was some real attempt to reform aid. I think there has been substantial progress, in the, especially the last 15 years. One of the big changes in the processes by which aid is administered is, if we believe in democracy, the responsibility for how money is spent should be left largely up to the governments and the people of the country. The role of the aid donors should be to provide them with more resources and transfer knowledge, advice, but the ultimate responsibility lies with the government and the people of each country. Why are we poor? I think we are poor because we have mismanaged our resources. We have mismanaged our resources, both human resources and natural resources. This is a question of good governance, really. The biggest accountability gap we have is a state-citizen accountability gap. The unfortunate reality is that a lot of the programs don't reach the people, either because of inefficiencies, uh, but often also because of corruption and misuse of resources. 
We're talking about billions and trillions all the time, wasted. The amount of money flowing out of Africa in illicit financial flows is double the amount of aid it receives. And it can be as much as three times. So we ask, what's going on here? We give one with our left hand and we take two by our right hand. And then we go to sleep happily, knowing that we help those poor people. One of the big problems we have is that it's not just that these people have become superbly, I mean, sort of extremely rich in a short period of time. Very often it's linked to tax evasion and, you know, dodgy tax deals, uh, in intercorporate uh, deals, which are uh, really murky. Where dictators are going to hide their money? They're not going to put it in the bank accounts or, you know, do not walk to the branch around the corner and deposit the million in it. They, they will put it in all these anonymous companies. So this is a wonderful vehicle for criminals, petty criminals, normal criminals, and political criminals and economic criminals. And we need really to banish this form of companies. Shell companies are legal constructs devised not by lawyers in Africa, but by lawyers in London, which conceal the true ownership of companies and the bank accounts that they open in secrecy havens around the world. And uh, shell companies turn out to be the, the main vehicle for corrupt money. So it's very important to, to bust that legal structure. We need to ask our politicians, why we still have that class of companies available. And this class of companies are not only in leafy offshore islands. No, they're in the United States, they're in the UK. We need to deal with that. Otherwise, all our talk about corruption, frankly, is just, is just plain talking. It's not serious. And so the task is for G20 countries to put our house in order so that we're not inadvertently aiding and abetting the crooks who are the enemies of the people who are trying to, to lift their societies out of poverty. Politicians don't corrupt themselves. Politicians have partners in the process of corruption. What is being delivered to our kids? Is there food on the table? What is unemployment, jobs, pay, etc.? What is the state of the rural sector? These are the things you really, freedom of association. If I stand and, 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 and I express my views, will somebody come and beat me up? Are we free to express our views? Are we free to choose the people who want to choose for office or uh, any representative uh, position? Uh, this, this is really all about governance. If we talk about aid, for instance, the last month we had a case in Venezuela where four journalists working for a website had to flee from the country because they feared repression after they exposed that a Colombian executive close to the Venezuelan president had made much money selling food on inflated price for a program designed to feed Venezuelan poor. We're in a new age where it's much easier to get proper rigorous evaluation of the effectiveness of aid. There are cases when you can notice that some report changed things. For instance, those investigative journalists working on world level who produced the Panama Papers, or in Europe, the LuxLeaks, which prompted the judicial authorities to take steps and which had and will have also, uh, as a consequence, the changes on policies because the global frauds are now can be denounced. How do we make sure that the justice issue is not forgotten as we move ahead? And uh, fundamentally, it's about are people empowered? Do they have information? I would refer to Reuters' uh, report on the Rohingyas situation in Myanmar 
which helped and which pushed the American authorities to, to ask for independent inquiry about the situation and also to ask for the two journalists who produced information to be released because they had been detained. Everywhere we look, we see new ways of holding governments to account for the promises they make. People are using information technology, communication technology, to gather new information so that politicians can't tell us lies, so that politicians have to live up to the promises they make. There is an old saying that press is the fourth power. You have the legislative, the executive, and the judicial power, and they say the the press is the fault. I, I definitely prefer the expression, journalists are the watchdogs of democracy. They report and they, they bring the public opinion non-official news to help citizens build their, their own opinion. And in this sense, I would say there is no democracy without press freedom and journalists contribute to the development of the democratic life. Media is very important is the icon of democracy. It's the key for all freedoms, rights. If we want to reach to the good governance, we should guarantee the press freedom. Sometimes journalists pay the highest price for their jobs, their lives. Some journalists remain very long time uh, 500 days, 600 days in jail without coming in before a judge. And of course, it's a scandal that journalists are killed because they are doing their job. But the biggest scandal is that nine assassinations on 10 of journalists remain unpunished. We need to balance the perception and the discussion about African leadership. We have some criminals, but we have some wonderful people, just like everybody else. You guys had Hitler, you had Mussolini, you had Berlusconi, you had all kinds of people there. It implies that Africa public sector is full of crooks. There are some crooks there, but basically there's a lot of people with integrity in these jobs and they're struggling against terrible odds. I think the most important thing to ensure that the money that is given in aid is, is well spent, greater transparency, and greater involvement of those who are going to receive, supposed to benefit from the money. They are the ones who are most incentivized to make sure that the money isn't wasted. They want to make sure that the money that was intended for them actually gets to them. I have to say, my brothers and sisters in the developing world, the elites in the developing world. Stop criticizing the West until ourselves we resolve problems of corruption, dishonesty, mismanagement in our own countries. My own view is that this claim that there's lots of corruption is very, very, very much exaggerated, and it's part of the attack on aid. Democracy cannot evolve and blossom overnight. It is a long-term process. What's needed is to channel aid through institutions and organizations which subject themselves to proper evaluation. And so build trust. Pick your partner, ask for the right kind of processes and audit afterwards. Those are all ways in which we can reduce corruption. There has to be a more simplified process. There has to be less bureaucracy, because bureaucracy means time, bureaucracy means money spent on itself. And then you have a, uh, exacerbating the conditions in the country because of the slow delivery implementation of uh, the promise uh, aid. Not all aid should be spent on things which are easily demonstrated to be effective. If we go that route of only things that can be clearly demonstrated to be effective, we'd end up with a lot of bed nets, but no efforts to, for example, reduce corruption. And so the things that are hard to evaluate are sometimes very important. I think that 
aid can come and should come in a number of ways. In civil disasters, like a major tsunami or something like that, UN agencies are really the only first possible responders, along with many NGOs like the Red Cross or Red Crescent and others. And it very much depends on where, when, which institution has relative strengths and weaknesses, how one directs aid. The key thing is that there is aid and that the resources are there on time. The NGOs have a particularly important role to play in those countries where governments are weak, but even in countries where governments are, are strong, I think they can play an important complementary role to that of the, uh, you might say, more governmental institutions. The advantage that NGOs have is that they can innovate. That's their big advantage, is that they, they can, in some sense, a government can't really say, we tried this and we failed, because failure is, it's very hard to admit failure. Civil society is very strong, very creative, very active, very dynamic. At the moment, the NGOs are run as beautiful boutiques because a photo of the boutique is what puts money in the tin. One of the assumptions that many people make is that the aid industry is full of NGO types, you know, doing good, traveling the world. But if you actually look at the facts, a tiny sliver of the aid budget actually goes to those non-governmental organizations and increasing amounts of it goes to big business, whether it's accounting firms or defense firms who are being contracted to build things. We need to really get to the bottom of why it is that so much public money is being spent on these big businesses and not in those non-governmental organizations or charities that people want to support. The multilateral moment was basically after the Second World War. By multilateral, I mean the organizations like the World Bank, the United Nations, that pool our resources in some sort of coherent management structure. The IMF is the world's best repository, for example, of advice on taxation. It's been involved in many countries in the improvement of the way that tax revenue is spent. Now, those two things have a vital effect on the ability of a country to handle its own affairs. There have been occasions where it has been a bit doctrinaire in terms of the kinds of policies that it has tried to impose. The World Bank is rather different. The World Bank gives loans. The World Bank is a multilateral donor and lender and many countries supply their own aid resources through the World Bank. You build up, in those circumstances, areas of expertise which can be shared and used to support developing countries. The most successful story, China, not only has it had rapid economic growth, but it's made large efforts to ensure that the benefits of that growth are shared by people at the bottom. If you look at the way in which China accelerated during the 1980s and 90s, a lot of that was with a strong involvement of policy advice, particularly from the World Bank. In multilateral institutions, those institutions reflected to some extent the interest of the major shareholders, particularly the United States. We can't have a situation where the United States determines who's the president of the World Bank. We can't have a situation where Europeans get to say who's the executive director of the IMF. I mean, that's, you know, that's outdated, arcane in a world where power dynamics are changing, where the economic reality is changing so quickly. I am very strongly in favor of such different multilateral organizations, provided that they are really multilateral, so covering all countries and not only some. In the case of the World Bank, I think there have been times when the IMF's insistence on drastic cutbacks have uh, pushed countries into recession. There is no law which creates the bank for the poor. As a result, microcredit remains an isolated NGO activity and so on. 
I've been debating with World Bank, uh, debating with the other regional banks, African Development Bank, Asian Development Bank, and so on. Why don't you have a separate window to provide this financing for the poor and encourage governments to create legislation to create bank for the poor so that a separate class of bank can be created, a separate regulatory authority can be created so that banking for the poor becomes a mainstream banking rather than footnote in banking. I actually believe that there ought to be a, a whole portfolio. Each of them has their strengths. Each of them has, uh, to some extent, its weaknesses. The international institutions like the World Bank and the IMF, I think today are doing a better job than they used to. They have the ability to interact with governments in a way that can more effective in shaping policies. So not just projects, but policies and institutions. Unfortunately, they sometimes in the past have not used that power in a way that I think is constructive for reducing poverty. Aid should be channeled in whatever way is going to be most effective, and it very much depends on the particular needs at the particular time. So generalizations about the most effective way of channeling aid, I believe, are dangerous. Sometimes, where governments are effective, doing the right thing and through a democratic process decide what their priorities are, I think we should get behind them and they are the most effective agents of change. But other times, if you have a totally corrupt government, then I think it's dangerous to go through governments or you might want to go through one ministry or one department or one province or one city. That's a reformer. And civil society can play an extremely powerful role, not least in holding the accountability, ensuring the funds are well spent and community organizations can play an amazing role. I'm a big fan of scaling up NGO service delivery, and for that, we'll need a larger share of the, of the financial pie. But in return, NGOs have to be accountable. And first and foremost, they have to be accountable in the societies in which they're operating. I think it's better, if you can, to work with governments and improve their systems. So make an aid commitment over five years or ten to, say, a health department or an education department in a country and then work with them so that they will train teachers, commission books, build buildings, maintain buildings, so that by the end of the partnership there's a sustainable system of health care or of education in that country. I think there's things NGOs can do that no one else can do, but if they run projects, then the project only lasts as long as they last. And when they go away and the grant funding stops, nothing is left in that country. So working with governments to strengthen their systems is, I think, enormously important. So there's a place for both. I really do believe that where we have done the homework, where we've identified the reasons why programs don't work, where we've looked for programs that do work, we just know a lot more and are much better positioned to spend money. We mustn't be formulaic and insist there's just one way of doing it. My view is that one of the main reasons that poverty has not been eradicated is that governments haven't had sufficiently strong pro-poor growth policies. The growth of markets and the emerging markets, developing countries, have been the sources of growth for economies and the world economy as a whole. That increases the market opportunities for our exports. For development, developing countries did already from the very beginning, in the early 1950s, as soon as they had become independent, we would like to get aid, but as a matter of fact, we need trades. Their export possibilities were limited. They always got too low prices. They always had to meet high tariffs, trade, not aid. Of course, they meant trade and aid because they never say no to aid. We don't want countries to remain aid dependent. We want them to move from the handout to the hand up approach. And actually, many developing countries would much prefer to have investors come in, build new businesses, provide new services, so that their population can be consumers in their own right, rather than be aid-dependent. 
This would be a good thing for aid to create social business fund in each country so that the same money can be recycled so that people are encouraged to come up with business ideas to solve problem. And this money goes in and then does the work with the social business and comes back to the fund. So the aid money doesn't disappear. Aid money becomes bigger and bigger each year. I really think aid can play a very important role in the development of Africa. Of course, you need to focus on that kind of intervention, which really trigger serious development. Aid could revise a lot of its goals if they were not so intent on just simply alleviating the situation of those who suffer, but rather also investing in the means that are necessary for them to leave that suffering but get, by getting organized into a world where there's a division of labor and where all wealth is created. It is not just about removing trade barriers and freedom of movement of goods and capital, but actually the means to do that is important. So we need to have the roads, the railways, power. Power is very important. We don't have much of electricity and that is holding the continent back. So we need really to link our grids. We need to improve our, to improve our ports, speed the, the process of goods passing through our borders. Infrastructure offers, let's say, two big things. It offers connectedness and it offers power. So connectedness, transport infrastructure, roads, rail, ports, air, just links people and what they produce into world markets. And that is vital in order to grow out of poverty. Couldn't the Australians, the World Bank, uh, the Japanese, and so many countries that provide us money or claim to provide us, set up for our country a modern electrification system? We didn't have it for 10 years. They didn't do that. Why didn't they upgrade our uh, airport so that today we would have a, a modern small airport to accommodate expanded tourism that is needed for the economy of the country? Why didn't they build for us a new modern small port? We still have the same port that can only accommodate two, three ships at a time. Sometimes ships wait outside for one month before they're able to uh, unload their cargo. They didn't do that. Where it was this $3 billion went? What we really need is smart aid. Smart aid which can leverage everything around it. That's what we need. Where aid has targeted specific programs that, for example, improve water sources or improve vaccination practices or where it has brought better pedagogy to schools and funded organizations to do those, we have certainly laid a basis for growth. My view of the world is one, we should do what we can to reduce suffering, and then maybe growth will happen or not, but we should make a better world, irrespective of that. Is it not that poor people have less talent, rich people have uh, more talent? The reality is rich people have more options, more opportunities, and poor people have no opportunities. That's why they're stuck. So one way to get rid of it, uh, allow them to move on, is to create those opportunities which are available to other people in the uh, top level of the society. If we are to achieve sustainable growth in society, we must look at our children. And it is very simple. If a child learns better, she or he will earn better and become a member of society. We will actually have a more healthier, wealthier society around the world. One of the most important reasons that inequalities persevere, disparities persevere, is lack of educational opportunity. The children of the poor don't have access to school, of first-rate education. They don't, as a result, 
aren't able to live up to their potential. Unfortunately, poor countries often don't have the resources to provide education for all. And that's where assistance from the richer countries to the poor is so important. For a fraction of what countries like the United States spend on weapons, we could provide education for all, for all people in the developing countries. The same thing is true for health. When the weapons manufacturers want money, they engage another war, and military spending goes on. But a portion of that colossal amount of money which goes into these sectors can solve the problem for the development. It is quite clear that the 120 or even one might say $150 billion worth of ODA will be woefully inadequate. Governments need to engage with the private sector. Particularly where you have corporations that operate in developing countries, I think they have a responsibility to help people around them, people who are working for them. The issue of multi-stakeholder partnerships, or the concept, really started to flourish way back in the 90s, when Ted Turner came to the United Nations in September 1997 and committed $1 billion for UN causes. To properly use your money in a charitable way requires almost the same kind of skills that it does to make it. I don't consider what we're doing is, is making a gift or just giving the money away to philanthropy. I consider it making an investment in the future of humanity. There are times when it is uh, uh, less risky to take a risk than, than to, uh, to avoid it. The greater your capacity to give, the greater your moral obligation to give. Well, certainly pro rata, the rich, the wealthy, who have the capacity to give more, don't. It seems to me clear that you get much better value for your donation by helping people in extreme poverty than you do by, let's say, spending $100 million, as recently donated to the Lincoln Center in New York, so that wealthy Manhattanites and international tourists can listen to great music in a newly renovated and somewhat improved, no doubt, concert hall, rather than the concert hall that they already have as part of the Lincoln Center. People concentrate a great deal on uh, the wealthy and uh, the big philanthropists, and of course, that's right and proper. But it is the unsung philanthropists who, month after month, year after year, support their selected charities with small but regular sums. And they really are the underpinning of a lot of charity. This is an amazing thing when you hear about the income disparity. 85 people in the world owning half the wealth of the world. How ugly can you be? What kind of system is that? And to put it many other ways, a bottom half of the world people owns 1% uh, of the total wealth of the world. Again, who owns the rest of it? So those are the questions. It's a product of the system that we have created. The priorities of this world are Perverted, but just accumulating riches is not the end game. Listen, the reason you're rich is because you're so good with money in the first place and you're greedy, okay? That's what makes you rich. What good is it to be rich when everybody else is poor? If the super rich give, let's say, half of their income or half of their wealth even to aid causes, they're still going to be very wealthy. They're still going to be far wealthier than the average person, the average wage earner. There are cases of uh, brain imaging studies where people are making choices about whether to give or not give. And when they decide to give, you can see that parts of their brain associated with 
rewards, that is those parts of the brain that are active if you have delicious food or great sex, they light up when people give as well. Muhammad said it and, uh, and, and so did Jesus, that the rich should give alms to the poor, right? I mean, every, every religion in the world, the Hindu religion, they all say the same thing. The Jewish religion, they all say that you should, the rich should give to help the poor. I mean, that makes sense, doesn't it? You know, it kind of levels everything out a little bit. There was an extraordinary Jesuit priest in Brazil in the 1970s. He was the founder of liberation theology. And he said, when I feed the children, they call me a Christian. And when I ask why the children are hungry, they call me a communist. What he was really saying is that everybody loves you to feed the kids. But the point of aid should not be feeding people who are hungry. The point of aid should really be, how do you disrupt the system? How do you create a system where you're asking the question, why are they hungry? How do we stop the hunger? How do we empower them so they're not hungry anymore? One of the ways that you can increase giving is to make it more attractive to give. Well, we need to find a way, I think, uh, of using money that's already in the government budget and uh, use it to attract new donations by matching. It seems to me if we had a, an arrangement where the government took some of the money that is in the aid budget in any case and it so arranges things that every time somebody gives a hundred Pounds. Another hundred pounds comes out of that part of the aid budget. This matches quite directly. And that could be put into aid. I think we could work out a scheme along these lines. Now, if we do that, I think that it would give an incentive for people to greatly increase donations. And that's what you're after. Aid flows are mainly from government to government, global financial institutions and agencies, but with not enough money actually being spent on the ground. People are rightly concerned about high administration costs and corruption issues. We could improve on the current arrangements that are intended to encourage giving. The business of philanthropy has a new innovative model. It proposes to encourage increased private contributions by matching those donations from government to development aid budgets. Taxpayers will also be invited to make donations. The target is to raise $100 billion a year, called the MM model. It's the brainchild of Nobel Prize winning economist Sir James Mirlees and the founder of the Fortune Forum, Renu Mehta. I came across one telling statistic. The rich give about 0.7 to 1% of their wealth to good causes, whereas those on lower incomes give around 3%. It's really shocking, isn't it? Shouldn't it be the other way around? One reason people don't give as much as they should to aid is because they're a bit skeptical about how well it works. They uh, feel that too much gets lost in fraud and corruption. There's obviously some truth in that. Essentially, you're wanting people to feel they get more for their money. You do that either by somehow or other multiplying up the effect of their money directly, so more money goes with it, or you do it by increasing the effectiveness of the money, or same kind of thing, really, that, that make people more aware of the good that their, their money is doing. On one hand, we need to find the money mm -hmm. to meet these needs, and also we need to ensure that the money is spent um, wisely to ensure that money actually gets to the people on the ground. It could turn out to be one of history's most important and significant contributions to development.
this is the philosophy which we are at the moment trying to get around to the governments of the world to change their policies, especially the G20 where the 90% of the wealth of the world lies. The amount of money that they're talking about could even be enough to more or less save the world if they placed it properly. I'd like to see a channel of aid money which went from whoever's willing to provide the aid, whether it's individual donations or governments or a matching between individual private donors and government, which seems a good idea. I like the idea of challenging governments to say, we will raise so much, but you must amplify it by an equal amount. The idea is excellent. The issues that have to be dealt with, many of them, things like you know, education, poverty, health, are too big for philanthropy. However, private initiatives are much more innovative than governments, so governments can benefit from the examples set. If governments engage with them, partner with them, collaborate with them, they will benefit from the private sector acumen, the business type of model of addressing problems. Many other philanthropists avoid government. They like to do it alone. We expressly seek to set an example and to actually engage governments. I think it's a very good thing for governments to help charities to raise money by offering them matching funds. It's really a win-win because it's good for the recipients of a charity to get the support the charity gives, but it's also good for the donors. There's plenty of research showing that people who are generous are more satisfied with their lives and are more likely to help others too. I do believe that once the problem has been solved, where I think the NGOs are much better, then I think the governments often have the skill to, to turn that into a big program. So I think there is a real complementarity between funding governments and funding NGOs, and you have to find the right time to do each. So you fund an NGO when you don't know the answer. You fund the government when you think you know the answer. I think it's very important in the process to make connection with trustworthy NGOs, civil society organizations, who have a proven track record about the proper spending of funds. Because too much aid money goes into pockets for which it is not intended, and too small a percentage of aid money reaches the grassroots for which it is intended. It needs to be accountable for the people who are providing the finance. And that's some combination of individual donors and government donations from the donor countries. And having private donations as part of that is quite a good way of enforcing accountability. A scheme which ensures donors that their money will be used for the purpose for which it is given it is fundamentally important. If we can achieve that, I think donations will grow. Aid will grow and aid will improve its track record of really making a difference. The MM model is a rescue plan aimed at building a more prosperous, just and stable future. when poverty strikes, it strikes in a way that it seems almost impossible to change, but it can be changed. I think there's some cost in reading this too negatively. I think a lot of people become very pessimistic when, in fact, it's all good news. I mean, you know, the poverty has fallen enormously. People are living much longer. Children are not dying in, at birth. Everything is better now than it was 50 years ago, a lot better. In the past 30 years, there's been massive success in development and poverty reduction in the world. We've gone from something like 50% of the population of the world being extremely poor to down to about 10% now. It's partly because of the rise of China, 
But, you know, the World Bank was a big player in China reforming itself, and the World Bank gets funding from the aid system and so on. No longer is aid or development some sideshow. Aid is catalyzing growth. Some countries needed aid in order to grow. And then you didn't have to give the aid anymore because they do, could do it on their own. Example, India. This has never happened before. When you have very rapid global population growth at the same time, you have desperate poverty coming down. And that's because of many factors, including effective aid and many others, the transformations in China, in much of Africa, Latin America, and elsewhere. There are fewer people in absolute poverty as a proportion of the world's population. We are making inroads into diseases like measles and malaria. They're killing fewer people. We are seeing economic growth in some of the world's poorest countries in, uh, in Africa. There are a lot of indicators that aid is not a bottomless pit, that aid is actually highly effective in reaching some of the world's poorest people. On an indicator like literacy, which is so critical, you see this doubling of literacy rates in the world over the last 25 years. Average life expectancy in the world's increased over the last 30 years by about the same amount it took from the Stone Age to the 1970s. That's the good news. In some parts of the world, uh, there have been, you might say, unfortunate events. Uh, the AIDS epidemic in Africa has clearly impeded the success of that region. Average life expectancy in Southern Africa went down by 20 years, while it improved by 20 years in the rest of the world. But when you look at the whole of Sub-Saharan Africa, the story has been of immense progress. Immense progress in the creation of democratic institutions, of civil participation. Aid has got better, and that's for some very simple reasons. One is that until the beginning of the 1990s, aid was highly political. It was an instrument in the Cold War. And so the effectiveness of aid was judged by the political yardstick of, did it keep our guys in power, rather than by, was it actually reducing poverty? So it's only the last 20 something years that you've seen the purpose of aid switched onto what we now think of as its task. Since the end of the Cold War, since the 90s, Aid has improved in its effectiveness year after year. And there are a number of reasons for this. The first is that more and more countries have become democratic and put in place the institutions which enable them to make the decisions effectively for how they will prioritize the aid. I'm talking about the recipient countries. The second is that the donor countries have learned a lot about how aid works, why it works. A lot of my own work has been on randomized controlled trials. This is a sort of the, perhaps sometimes called the gold standard of testing. So really, if you wanted to test out a program, you can randomly assign it to some locations and not others and compare them. And because they're randomly assigned, you know that the areas that got the program were just like the ones that didn't to start with. And therefore, the difference can be assigned to the program. It's a very simple idea, but one that a number of the uh, results from our cities have had very substantial policy influence. There is now among a large number of countries a real commitment to make sure that aid is effective. We've learned a lot about how to improve aid effectiveness. So I think we can make aid more effective. Aid's got better because there's a learning process and there's much better techniques of evaluation now than they used to be 20, 30 years ago. So aid is improving, but it's a changing scene. We're actually talking at a time of a record of enormous success and progress. But you don't hear about it, people don't feel it's going on. So there's been a sort of failure to tell the story of the success. Some of the countries that are still extremely poor and maybe more difficult countries to work in, very small countries, very fragile countries, countries with conflict around their borders and so on. So we're probably getting to a number of countries where it's harder to make such vast progress. First order fact is poverty is, what we've learned is it's not inevitable, that it's, it's been coming down. And I believe that with some effort, we could make it entirely go away.
It's not perfect. There's still too many cases of corruption or misuse of funds. But compared to previous periods, aid has never been more effective and the donor countries have never been wealthier. And so that we are giving less aid per capita, particularly in Africa, which needs it most, is, I believe, a scandal. I think the public, well, one, seeing the aid budget go up when everything else is cut, made people angry and lots of right-wing politicians and the press kept denouncing it and kept suggesting all aid is corrupt and all of it goes to rich, corrupt leaders, which isn't true. So there's been a bombardment of attacks on aid. Audience is fond of sensationalist uh, news. And there was the, the problem with Oxfam, because all Oxfam activities were forgotten because the, the attention was concentrated on a old case of an uh, improper sexual conduct of one of its employees. We have lots of debates about aid. I've been uh, one of the critics of the aid. But I must tell that aid has done a wonderful thing. It has reached out to uh, the countries which normally would not have done the things on their own. Aid has helped them to bring new ideas, new technologies, new uh, structures and so on. That's fine. But I'm saying that, that, can, that aid can do much better than what it has done. That's the only complaint I'm making. Not, I'm not saying that aid should be stopped. On the question of whether there is enough aid getting through to people, well, I think a lot of the answer is just there isn't enough aid. Countries, you know, the idea that 0.7% of GDP is a lot is bizarre to me. So I, I start from a, the premise that, you know, somehow we have not sold the idea of aid well enough. We haven't persuaded people that generosity is, there's some worth to the generosity. Somehow there, it's, in fact, the whole conversation on aid has been one which has sort of highlighted all the failures of aid in recent years and therefore has discouraged people from funding it. So I think the first order fact is that there isn't enough money. Then some of that money is fake aid, goes to, you know, placate some, you know, powerful person in some country or the other. So there's lots of fake aid. So you leave all of that out. It's just, it's just a tiny part of world GDP. I think the first order concern is to raise that amount. And then we can, the second thing to do is to spend it well. And I think those are tied because if we spend it well, more people will be willing to pay for it. And between those things, we, we could make it much bigger. If you're only looking at it from a perspective of economics and stopping war, stopping terrorism, it's in our interest to increase aid. However, the way we've used aid has so often been fraught with extraordinarily terrible abuses, corruption, and mismanagement. Those are fixable problems. And so really what we need to do is increase the aid and fix the problems, ensure that there's transparency, ensure that the aid programs are well thought through, and ensure that the people who are really the target of the aid are actually getting the aid and not others. What I think we need to do is increase foreign aid enormously because that's in the interest of the United States. There has to be a lot more pressure on the U.S. Congress, on the U.S. administration. U.S. policymakers, who are particularly U.S. presidents, talk a lot and eloquent speeches. You know, President Obama is a great orator, but when it comes to delivery, he has delivered very little, and that because of U.S. congressional opposition. In spite of all the progress we are making, the morality in society is shrinking. In all spheres of life, we, we, we see the politics is becoming more shallow and our promises become more hollow for our children and the deprived sections of society. I think people just think there's poor people having famines and we should send them some money. Um, or not. And it's a rather primitive understanding of the complexity of what is done. And I think we should do more to have a really informed public debate, actually about the whole of foreign policy. I think if the public understood more, Britain could be a much more useful country in the international system rather than just a American poodle. These are struggles that can only be won 
in these countries society by society. We cannot, as outsiders, cannot win other people's struggles for them. It's their struggle, not ours. And we should always remember that we are, uh, we're the bit players. That said, what we can do can make a difference. We've got a moral responsibility to do what we can to empower the people whose struggle it is. And there's a lot more we could do than we're doing at the moment. Consciousness is the, is the first step towards social transformation. What is meant by poverty, it's not only an economic issue. The things that go along with poverty are also violations of human rights. So people who live in extraordinary poverty rarely have the right to free expression. They rarely have strong political rights. They have very little influence in general over governments um, or government policy or the decisions that are going to impact their lives. They rarely have decision-making power over their access to health care or access to education. Just as we need to address economic disparities, we have to address the disparity of voice and power. Take any issue you like women's rights, civil rights, uh, opposition to concern over nuclear weapons, over the environment, whatever, abolitionism. Unless there's strong popular activism, uh, wealth and power are going to concentrate in ways which increase the level of injustice, oppression, uh, undermining of freedom and democracy. That's almost automatic. The communities should fly with two wings, which is women and men. And when we invest on uh, women, that means that we will reach to the sustainable development, to the sustainable peace, to the healthy community. We should reach to the full participation of women in all fields in the, in the community if we want to have strong communities uh, that can, you know, defend on all the rights of people, the rich communities, the power communities. I have full trust in the power of young people for changing the world, not as the followers, but as the leaders. The underlying issue really is, you know, what is the social contract that uh, citizens have with the state? The system of power and domination looks all-powerful, but in fact, it's extremely fragile. It relies on obedience and consent. And as when that obedience and consent are withdrawn, it can very quickly collapse. We've seen that time after time in history, and uh, we can see it again. It's held up by a system of uh, propaganda and willingness of the population to subordinate itself and not to pursue the options that are open to us and that we can undertake, which will cause this system to erode and open the way to a much more just and free society online activism, you know, the unimaginable numbers of people signing petitions about issues that were once obscure, but are really now mobilizing large numbers of people. The recent period, last roughly 30, 40 years, a period of a kind of neoliberal assault against the global population, has sharply increased disparity of wealth and with it political power, oppression, uh, many other negative characteristics. And it can be reversed, but it has to be reversed by the only way the change has ever come. In a relatively free country like the United States, or other European comparable countries, there are many avenues open. The state has quite limited capacity to repress. There are difficulties, but uh, not insuperable ones, much easier than in the past, in fact. It can be reversed, just as it was reversed in the, uh, the 1930s and 40s. And there's only one way that can happen. 
by popular mobilization. All the history tell us that in all great change around the world, in all great revolution, the people win. My earliest memories are of when my father was the attorney general in the United States at the height of the civil rights movement. And at the time, there was no group of people who he admired more than the Freedom Riders. There were people who were willing to be beaten or killed in their protests against injustice, in their protests against the American apartheid system. But he thought that ultimately, the way to secure civil rights was not going to be through protests and not through civil disobedience. But the real change agent for civil rights was going to be through the law. It was going to be through the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act. And he, he believed that because if you empower people politically, they can take care of themselves. They can take care of their own communities. And that's really the connection, the disparity between wealth and poverty is not just about money. It's about power in every way. So it's about ability to influence the political system. It's about access to education. It's about access to health care. Wealthy people have all those things. People living in poverty have none of them. It's hard to really take a look at what's going on in the world, in the, particularly in the third world, the developing world, and uh, not really be touched by it and want to do something to help. I think that our humanity is, is the source of it is empathy. We can put ourselves in other people's shoes. The well-being of somebody still matters whether I can see them or not, whether they're of my nationality or of different nationality, whether of my race or a different race. We have been teaching our children all the things. We taught them good things, but we have taught them identities. You are Hindus, you are Muslims, you are Christians. Children are not born as that, with that identity. We have imposed those identities on them and we taught them to be Indian or Pakistani or, or, or Americans or Africans or whatever. We have created borders, we have created all these things. We have created those teachings which divide humanity. We really cannot succeed if society around us is failing. We'll have to succeed together. In the end, when you're concerned with development, you're concerned with disparities. One of the questions that Adam Smith set himself to answer, and it was one of the questions that led to the creation of the subject of economics. Why is water so cheap and diamonds are so dear? Because water is obviously a lot more useful than diamonds, and I would want to add is actually more attractive than diamonds. He gave an obvious answer, that it had to do with scarcity. But the real point is that price does not measure the true value of things. A woman who earns a tiny wage is not less important or less deserving than one who earns a million. We want her to have a bigger income. That's one thing that aid seeks to achieve. Notoriously, economists disagree with one another. They have different views about aid. Surely, when nearly a billion people are in serious poverty, we must try to do something about it. Some question the cost of aid. Is it too high? I think almost all economists would agree that if aid could be deployed efficiently, a relatively modest increase would eliminate extreme poverty. And extreme poverty has indeed diminished, partly as a result of aid. But a terrible amount remains. I hope we care enough to deal with it. I believe there is a universal faith in the potential of our human counterparts who aspire in pockets all around the globe. 
But in the face of their anguish, we do little to transform the aid system. In the social contract, Jean-Jacques Rousseau stated, as soon as one says about the affairs of the state, what does it matter to me? The state must be regarded as lost. Rousseau suggests here an inequality of public action. For if we remain silent, we are resigning our principles to governments and our rights as taxpayers. It would be consenting to the very injustices that we denounce and would further perpetuate disparities. If people freeload, if people watch and wait for others to stand up, this would be leaving real aid to chance. And so the prospect eludes us. How can a world so cultured and connected be so stark and unequal? How do we connect our character to those who just need a little hand in the beginning so they can ultimately stand up on their own with dignity? Will the collective voice of caring citizens uplift nations to free the world from unnatural inequalities? This indeed rests on the bonds of the social contract. Without honouring our humanity, without profound collaboration, how can we possibly reach a reasonable place somewhere between opulence and destitution? rediscover the worth of human being. And each human being has to rediscover what is the purpose of his being here? What do I do while I'm here? I'm here on this planet for a very, very short time. And if I don't know what I'm supposed to do, what I should be doing for myself, I have to discover my worth in the context of the whole world, that I'm in the continuum of the human generations. I'm one little speck and I have the worth. I can influence the whole human history and I'm the most powerful being created. Each human being is very unique in the whole world. That person will not be repeated in the entire history of human being ever. So what do I do? How do I discover myself and be somebody that has done something and put a signature on this planet that I was here for this period of time?
notes on, which would, which would be really helpful in terms of statistical support for this film, is actually, it's very difficult to find out how much goes where because it's always concealed under layers and layers of different types of spending. It's a good question to ask because so it's sort of... People, yeah, I totally, I, I, could, I couldn't agree more. It's a, it's a great number to look for, but, you know, I've been in this space for a long time and I don't know the number. I don't know anything, any way of getting at it, not just I don't know the number. And also, the, it's, it's the way they're disguised, also, the, the, yeah. the wording and the, the definitions are different across the board and there's no way of comparing. Yeah, I mean, there's no accounting standard.